The video you're about to see was a presentation that I did to the Building Designers Association back in 2014. It's a presentation I gave passionately between 2012 and 2018, so six years on a weekly basis, two and three hundred times to architects, building designers, building companies, all the hardware chains and so forth for breakfasts and lunches and dinners and special events. This presentation was repeated over and over again. It has a simple message, the simple message being that if you are to insulate homes under the NCC standards of five star, six star, and potentially heading to seven star, there is one critical issue we have to have to control, and that's the management of internal moisture in the form of condensation building up within our buildings. If we were to continue using silver foil vapor barrier external building rooms. Lucky enough, it was in 2016 that the NCC changed to require the use of a vapor permeable wrap in climate zones six, seven, and eight. But really the requirement for an external highly vapor permeable building wrap is a requirement from Brisbane. So climate zones three all the way through to eight. And we have to uh, analyze climate zones two individually. Climate zones one is the only climate zone in Australia where an external silver foil wrap is required. So this wrap, this presentation was really to highlight the need for a change to our external walls and our roofs to adopt vapor permeable external building wraps that allow the internal moisture to permeate out of our buildings and avoid condensation risk, which leads to mold and commonly called sick building syndrome. I hope you enjoy the presentation. It was my passion for six, seven, eight years and uh, I did honestly try to get the message through to all the building professionals so that none of them were caught with the issues around mould in buildings. So I don't think anybody should have any excuse for having an issue with a building that is literally raining, damp, bacterial growth, the sort of building that may even be condemned on you and your clients may be asked to leave the building altogether. So that's what's not going to happen to anybody in this room and that's what's not going to happen to anybody in the BDAV. So that's my mission in life. I've done this presentation numerous times. I'm sure I'll make a mess of this one. So here's the word. It's a horrible word. It's a horror story. That's all we know at the moment. Okay, so the reason for uh, our condensation issues in cold climates, I'm going to talk about most of Victoria, I'm going to talk about parts of South Australia, and I'm going to talk about all of Tasmania, is the increase in lightweight construction. That's the first thing that's changed in our marketplace in the last 10 years, is that we're no longer a brick veneer society. We actually have lightweight materials, cement sheets, weatherboards, all sorts of metal claddings, aluminium composites that we're putting on the outside of our building. They don't offer our building any thermal mass any longer. So what happens is on a winter's morning when it's, uh, I'll call five degrees outside, as it commonly is around Victoria, the outside of your building is going to be five degrees. So that lightweight material's not going to offer any thermal mass. So the sarking you put on the outside of your building is going to be five degrees. With brickwork, thermal mass is generated during the day. It releases it overnight and you'll keep the outer sarking in your building somewhat warmer. So it won't be five, it might even be 10 degrees. High levels of insulation, okay, energy efficiency means we're going to adopt high levels of insulation, that's an absolute given. So the more insulation we put in our walls and ceilings, the actually colder we're going to keep the outer sarking material that we're familiar with using. So the lightweight construction is keeping us cold, the insulation's keeping that sarking, it's not warming it up at all. Without insulation, the heat in your house transfers through, warms, out that outer, warms up that outer sarking, and again, we keep that temperature up above the dew point. Increase in air tightness, obviously, we're going to trap the moisture in our buildings. The more we sark, the more we tape, the warm, more we're actually required to sark under tiled roofs. The more we use sarking, for example, is the more we're going to trap the moisture within the building, and that's going to give us greater energy efficiency. No longer our building is going to leak 30 odd air challenges an hour. We'll get it back to 20, we'll get it back to 15. We'll head to some sort of international standard of 10 or so. Rightio, so the creation of condensation really comes from uh, 
the pure fact that we're going to strive for energy efficiency. All this is a given. Those top three points and this fourth one here are not going to change. As long as you keep using a plastic sarking around your building and you wrap your building up in a plastic bag, I'm going to say this is one of the primary causes of condensation. So here it is here. The traditional use of sarkings or plastic barriers is your greatest enemy at this point in time. So energy efficiency means greater condensation risk. And I've got to sort of take this moment to really convince you not to use a plastic bag around your house. I wouldn't put a plastic bag on my head. I wouldn't, for a joke, put a plastic bag on a mate's head and throw him in the back of the car and drive him around for a couple of hours. I'd put a pillowcase on his head. I wouldn't walk up a hill with a plastic raincoat on, going for a hike for a couple of days. I'd get 10 minutes up the hill. I'd be taking the pack off. I'd be tearing the plastic raincoat off. And somebody would sort of hand me, my mate would hand me a, a Gore-Tex jacket. And he'd say, put this on. And I'd walk happily for the next two days, hail, rain, shine, night, day windy, so forth. I wouldn't camp in a plastic tent. So these things are really basically obvious, okay? But still, if it's got a shiny surface, it's made of a poly weave, so this is just a very strong plastic, very popular, very strong, very light, very easy to use. Uh, originally, we used um, craft paper sarkings. We're still available because they're actually nearly imperative to put behind metal claddings, simply because they don't shrink, plastic shrinks. So all I'm going to say, is that we'll move on, so I don't take too long. I'm going to say to you, we knew all about this. The CSIRO sort of developed the objectives towards, you know, five, six, seven, eight star. We are heading, obviously, towards eight star. We're not going to sit here stagnate at six star. And they just made the perfect comment that in 2000, when they realised the government was going to implement five and six star and head in the energy efficient direction, they said that obviously, they will go right down the bottom, while we keep it is because insulation, whilst it keeps the inside surfaces warm, it also keeps the inside surfaces cold. So the outside of our houses have never been colder than they are becoming now. So there's trends around the world. History tells us what's going to happen in life. It's good to look back at history. You know, we fight wars, we never win them, so, but we keep going to war, of course. So what I'm going to say to you is, around the world, be it Canada in the 70s, Europe, Japan, USA, New Zealand in 2000, the current bill to repair the housing stock in New Zealand sits at about $20 billion from mould, mildew and bacterial growth. So it's pretty much a given. Causes of condensation. The presence of cold temperature levels, so we are in a winter climate. I call Melbourne cold. I call Ballarat, Bendigo, Shepparton very cold and then I go up in the alpine areas and I call it extremely cold. So whether it's cold, very cold, extremely cold, I call Tasmania very cold in some extremely cold areas. These are prime conditions for condensation. The use of high insulation values, the presence of internal moisture and warmth, okay, that's another thing we're not going to change. Your house sits at probably an average around 55% humidity. Okay, it's not terribly high at all. This room's got a little bit of warmth in it. It's a bit muggy in here for me at the moment. Maybe it's just the pressure that I'm being put on. <laughs> but it's about, I'd say it could be 60% humidity. So it's only got to be 55%. Don't, you know, if you hop off a plane in Singapore, it'll be 85%. It doesn't have to be anything like that at all. 55% humidity is all you need. Okay, uncontrolled water flow. Uncontrolled water flow, water vapour from the inside, the warm side to the outside. You're not going to control that either because as soon as your house is warmer than the outside, there's a Newton pressure developed. So there's a moisture that is actually the air inside expands and that moisture gets forced to the outside of your building. So moisture inside, there's a whole lot of givens here. You know, we're cold, it's energy efficient, we're going to wrap up tighter, we're going to use insulation, we've got moisture, it's going to be pushed to the outside. Okay, the use of plastic sarkings, vapour barrier on the outside of the cold side. That is the problem. Just to give you an idea, a little bit of insight into condensation, really simple one. You see we've developed this presentation to be incredibly simple. The inside temperature. So if you walk into a bar and there's a couple of dozen blokes in the bar having some counterattacks and placing some bets and watching the football, you'll find that it might be 24, 20, 24 degrees Celsius. It'll be 55, 60% humidity. Even though they have a really good mechanical system that's constantly changing the air in that room, it's still going to be 55%. They're just trying to keep it down from 60, 65, 70% to keep you comfortable. Okay, you go, you go to buy a beer, glass of wine, 
immediately that beer's poured at 4 degrees Celsius, you have a 24 degree differential. It only takes 12 degree differential in temperature for that to occur on your beer glass. It only takes a 7 degree differential for the mist to arrive. It only takes 9 degrees for it to be obvious and it takes 12 degrees for it to turn into a droplet. 55% humidity, 20, 24 degrees Celsius. It's exactly the conditions you live in at home. Nothing unusual about this at all. Moisture in the house, where does it come from? It comes from your daily activities. No matter what house you're in, this is what you're doing inside of it. You're doing all these activities and you're generating 10 to 20 litres of moisture a day. So again, another perfectly given. So some houses are worse than others. I must admit, we'll look at a problem project. It might be a dozen townhouses and we have condensation in one of them. So we've got moist ceilings, moist walls, musty smells unhappy customers and it'll be because they particularly don't open their windows, they hang all their washing out on clothes horses, there's a few more people in there, they cook and boil more food than most of us, okay? So I'm just going to say, you will get a scenario where there'll be one problem house and it's similar to the other dozen and you don't understand why. It'll be an occupation issue. Okay, so then I'm going to say to you that all these things are going to happen and now you're sort of asking yourself, how does the moisture get through plasterboard to get to the actual plastic sarking that we've got our houses wrapped up in traditionally? Well, it's because most of the products that we actually line inside of our house with are vapour permeable. Here we have glass and steel up the top here, obviously very good at stopping moisture from passing. But when you get down here to cement sheet and plasterboard and insulation and brickwork, highly vapour permeable. Vapour is a microscopic droplet. I'm holding thousands of vapour droplets in my hand, that permeates through plasterboard with absolute ease. So there's nothing stopping the moisture from getting to the outside of our building either. So this is what's going to happen. We've actually got a little wall here with its plastic vapour barrier, we'll call it. Moisture through the plasterboard, under pressure, simply because we've got a warmer inside temperature than an outside temperature. As soon as there's a temperature differential, there's a pressure. Moisture hits the cold sarking unprotected by brickwork, we'll say. The point I'll make to you about brickwork is it's good at holding some thermal mass for a day or two. If you have a couple of cold days, you're in a valley, you're on the wet si uh, south side of the hill, there'll be no thermal mass left in that brickwork and your sarking will be getting as cold as the outside air. So we'll get that 5 and that 25, we'll get that 20 degree differential and you know 12 is the killer. Okay, so what's more likely to happen than go permeate through the plasterboard and insulation is the moisture in the house to find its way through through easier routes. So it'll be light fittings, power points, cracks in skirtings, any gap it can possibly find. It doesn't take much of a gap for air to leak through in copious amounts. This is where I try to... Whistle. <laughs> So I don't have to blow much air past my lips to whistle. So you can see, it's only going to be the smallest crack in the building. Pressure, you'll get a lot of air filtration through the building. That's going to be the result you'll see when you remove the cladding. Okay, so that's moisture that's found itself trapped by the plastic sarking. And of course you can see where it's, the insulation is damp, it's following the cold stripe of a, of a bit of bracing and so forth and so on. Okay, so that's the damage you'll see behind. I could show you a whole lot of shots from New Zealand which would be horrific. Buildings that are growing fur and just about walking away by themselves. But I'm just going to show you some shots here. This is out of Sydney. That's not your biggest problem. Your walls are going to be something you'll uh, you know, possibly have a problem with five or ten years down the track. We're going to talk about more immediate issues. So here we have our tiled roof. So under the bell requirements, you've got to run a sarking under your tiled roof to keep the ash out. So basically you've just put a vapour barrier. It's a silver reflective foil. It's got a metal facing. The tiles are giving you some mass protection for the first day or two of cold snap. But then this sarking is going to be the same temperature as the outside air. Okay, 24 degrees, call it 5 degrees, 20 degrees differential. Moisture is going to rise more than it's going to permeate through your walls, by the way, obviously. It's going to rise up and pressurise the underside of the ceiling. It'll permeate through the plasterboard. It'll flow in copious amounts through light fittings, exhaust, any sort of damage to ceilings. 
And obviously there's some condensation showing itself. So I'm going to say, we are having trouble with tiled roofs because they're sucked. If they're unsucked, they're nicely ventilated, not the biggest issue, but while they're sucked. So that's what you're going to see. You're going to see moisture running down the sucking. I'm going to say the problem is for you is that because we're using these tall R4, R5, R6 bats, you generally only have 100 mil here and you're pushing a 200, 220, 240 mil bat in. That moisture runs down, hits the insulation around the perimeter of your building and it'll dampen all the cornice areas. There's also a lack of airflow in the cornice or the corners of your building. The air tends to sort of roll around and miss the corner and not dry it out as well. There's a couple of issues happening there that's going to show that you'll get most of your condensation initially in the cornice areas shown up as moisture. Okay, so that's your tiled roof. Tiled roofs are not your big problem because they've got thermal mass. I'm not running around looking at tiled roof problems. I'm running around looking at corrugated iron and metal deck roofs. So here we have a metal deck roof. It's a corrugated iron roof, sorry. So you've got corrugated iron, 22 degrees, whatever it might be. The outside temperature is 5. That corrug this is worse now. This corrugated iron is going to be 0 degrees. It's a conductor. So if you go out in the, in the morning, I have a little, uh, you know, uh, uh, infrared thermometer. My car the other day it was a five degree morning. My car was from one degree to minus three on the surface of my car, depending on what, what, uh, which direction it was facing. So what you're going to find, five degrees outside, typical Melbourne cold morning. You've got zero degrees. The sarking is a conductor. Again, it's a vapour barrier. There's no moisture getting past it. It's pulled tight. Oh, I've never seen a roof of sag sarking. They're meant to sag at 40 mil. If they use the plastic stuff, it's going to shrink in the first summer. It'll be tight anyway. They're meant to use the actual craft paper. It doesn't actually shrink. So that'll be zero degrees. And of course, we've got our uh, steel top hats, which is very common now. So they'll be zero degrees. So what you've got up in your roof on a corrugated iron building is a, uh, a refrigerant coil. If you were to hop up through the manhole here, you'd step from 24 degrees to zero degrees. And you think, geez, I could hang meat in here. This is fantastic. But until you see the moisture running down the underside of the sarking. It hits the battens, it drips on the insulation, and then you've got damp and wet ceilings. Right, so the problems that we're looking at, you know, on a weekly basis is corrugated iron roofs. Metal deck roofs are actually worse because there's less airflow in a metal deck roof because it's usually obviously a lower pitch. It could be from zero to five degrees, we'll call it. So they're even going to be worse for condensation. So we have these buildings in Richmond, Mount Waverley. Cathedral ceilings are worse again for some reason because you've got very little air cavity in a cathedral ceiling. So I'm going to say to you, we're looking at buildings in Richmond, Hawthorne, Mount Waverley, Roval, Bundura. Another bad type of building is childcare buildings because it's got a high occupancy of people during the day, lots of washing, lots of cleaning, lots of eating, lots of cooking, lots of kids. So high occupancy buildings are a problem. Corrugated iron roofs are a problem. Cathedrals are worse. Metal decks are worse again. So we've got damp surfaces, musty smells, inefficient insulation because the insulation will be sodden so it won't be insulation any longer. It'll help to actually solve the problem. Uh, building rot, dust mite, as soon as we get anywhere near 60%. So within these ceiling cavities and wall cavities, you've got obviously mould, mildew and dust mite, and then you get bacterial growth. Then you get un This is the knockout below. Everybody here has a good look and sort of, you know, murmurs about this, but as soon as your building's unhealthy, sick building syndrome, unhealthy building syndrome, all around the world, we give it diff different terms and call it different names. But as soon as you get bacterial growth, that's the knockout blow. So we've had a couple of jobs like this because I'm going to show you one so you can see what I'm actually referring to. At some point in time, somebody's responsible. So I don't know if anybody wants to put their hand up and tell me who's going to be responsible. <laughs> and I don't want it to be you. That is the point. <laughs> because the only way to fix these problems is to pull your building apart. It's called thousands of dollars. The industry's changed. Okay, the BCA tells us that obviously we have a responsibility. Safeguard our occupants from illness and injury, protect our building from damage, from the accumulation of internal moisture in the building. So it's actually written in the BCA. So if you go to court, that's the first thing the prosecution is going to pull out in front of you. So this is the answer we've got for you immediately. A little bit of theory. I tend to want to give you the answer, then you can go and use whatever product you like, but at least, you, at least I'm going to give you an idea what I think the direction should be. Okay, so now we're going to look at using vapour permeable building fabrics. We're going to take away our plastic sarkings or our craft paper sarkings 
And we're going to put something in here that is vapour permeable. It lets the moisture out of the building, but it obviously keeps the wind, the rain and the dust out, obviously, from the outside. This is commonly what they use throughout Europe, America, Canada, New Zealand. In cold climates, they do not use plastic wraps, shiny silver plastic wraps. Right? Warm climates, not a bad idea. You've got to have this uh, cavity on the outside. So you've got to let the moisture out to something. You can't just fix your cement sheet or your weatherboards hard up against it, these vapour permeable fabrics, because simply you'll get the condensation occurring on the fabric itself. You've got to let the moisture out of the building. So I'll get rid of the bad stuff and I'll just point out the, what the good stuff sort of looks like. A wall wrap, a roof wrap. Okay, so again with the roof, the vapour is going to get through the ceiling. If there's light fittings, it's going to permeate, it's going to flow through into your ceiling cavity in, in absolute abundance. Um, the halogen downlight was the worst thing that happened to our housing industry for energy efficiency. They burn at 300 degrees Celsius, they're a great big hole in your ceiling. You turn them on, they suck all the warmth straight out of your room into your ceiling cavity. So, so the actual uh, moisture is going to permeate through. It's most likely going to be drawn up through your light fittings. My recommendation is to do away with the uh, recessed light fittings and go for surface mounted. If you're going to put you know, recessed light fittings, put them in bulkheads around the outside and run your ceiling insulation all the way through. What they also have in Europe is a set standard to create ceiling ventilation, by the way. So this is something that's going to be adopted here shortly. The other thing that might be adopted very shortly is they're going to make you put in more like a 100 mil insulation vat for the first sort of, you know, 400 odd mils and then you can put your R6, R7s. Then you're going to do a calculation based on the amount of R2.5, let's call it, and the amount of R5 and you'll get an R4.5 overall ceiling performance. You do have to calculate your ceiling, uh, your ceiling thermal loss too. So you always, whenever you do a house with recessed light fittings, you always have 2% thermal loss. So you've got to actually add 20% to your insulation because of the 2% thermal loss. I'll keep moving forward before I stop. Okay, so this is a house. This is some examples now. So this is what brings it home to you. This is a new house. They're only just doing the garden. It's nothing special. It's its first winter. We noticed condensation three years ago after the, after the drought for five years. So we're starting to get all these new houses. We don't get old houses condensating. We get new houses condensating. They don't have to be expensive houses. Actually, the smaller the house, the more likely it is to condensate. The smaller, the cheaper. Rightio, so here's our house. This is what the ceiling looks like. Sorry, the roof looks like. Uh, corrugated iron roof, something pulled tight, 5 degrees, 0 degrees, temperature differential greater than 20, enormous amounts of moisture dropping into the ceiling cavity. This is what the actual room looks like from below. The lady here is a little bit concerned, but you've got these dark, pa dark patches here of moisture where there is no insulation around the light fittings. You get dampness in the corners. You get light fittings themselves. It's actually conducting the cold out of the ceiling cavity. So that light fitting is sort of, you know, wanting to be sort of zero degrees, and it's 24 degrees in the house with 55 or 60% humidity. So it's really the, the moisture on your beer glass scenario. This is the culprit to a degree. A couple of culprits here, of course. Is one is that we have a, a lovely sort of relationship with R6 ceiling vats. Pull it up, 4R5, R6, doesn't make much difference. It tends to be put in to overcome poor design to get your energy rating up to a point of, you know, sort of 6 or so. So if you're poorly orientated or the design itself is poor, you find your energy rate of putting R6s in. Okay, so you can see here the actual top plate is probably back here somewhere. So the actual outside of this building is actually uninsulated, probably for about 18 inches right on the outside. So that ceiling insulation is getting close to near useless anyway. So the only answer we've got for you is to take away that cold surface. So we're actually going to stick with a vapour barrier product, but we're going to put our anti-con, anti-condensation blanket. It's been on the market for 20 years, so that's what it's always been intended for, and we'd like to see more of this product being dropped in under metal deck and corrugated iron roofs. It only needs to be the 60 mil, it only needs to be compressed in a cold climate like Melbourne, and that's enough to take away the outside air temperature turning this steel metal roof to zero degrees, Hopefully we'll get this foil closer to sort of 6, 8 or 10 degrees and we'll cure in Melbourne in a cold climate 80 to 90 percent of the condensation issue. Now when we go to a very cold climate, as we go to say Ballarat, Bendigo or the Dandenongs, this is starting to fall a little bit short but it's going to solve 
70, 80 percent of your condensation issues. At some point in time, the industry will have to adopt a roof spacer, something that actually allows this insulation to recover. At the moment, when that's compressed, we only get half of its thermal performance, just an R1.3. I can only give you 0.65 for it because it's compressed to two or three, fluffing up in the corrugations at the batten and recovers ever so slightly and we've got safety battens to contend with, so the, industry, the whole scenario is becoming more complicated. Okay, I'd love you to put a spacer on this. I'm gonna nearly determine in Ballarat and what I call very cold climates that we need a spacer to allow this to recover. And in extremely cold climates, we're gonna to go to the 100 mil blanket with an 80 mil spacer. So that's my answer for condensation under metal deck corrugated iron roofs in Melbourne. Add a space if you're very cold, make it a 100 mil blanket for extremely cold. It's sort of as simple as that. That's the anti-com blanket going down. This is just a bit of an, in I put this photo in here quickly, and I'm making my, con my, my, my presentation longer and longer. This is a house that has condensation. Um, it's a nice big house. Most of the condensation is on the south side of the roof. Um, this gentleman went and put um, free spinning whirly gigs, like this thing over here. He put three our aromatics, they're worth about $450 each. He put three of those in, it's got a low, medium and a high speed and he wired them all down to his kitchen and he sits there and he plays with the controls. What he's trying to do is suck that moisture out of the ceiling cavity. I'm going to say ventilation will play a very small part in solving condensation. The unfortunate part, the condensation risk is worse on those frosty mornings. So we get a few frosty mornings, okay. Bendigo Shepherding gets frosty mornings for three or four months of the year, and then other areas are just playing cold throughout the entire winter. So he plays with these uh, aromatic controllable ventilators, and on a cold morning, all he does is suck in that outside moist air that's probably more like 70 or 80% moisture, and he mixes it with the moist air in the ceiling cavity, and he actually creates more condensation. Okay, so as the... As the so as the... Uh, percentage of moisture in the air sort of grows from 60 to 70, the temperature differential reduces. So now we only need a three or four degree temperature. We don't need 12 degrees any longer, we only need three or four degrees. And we're having the same amount of moisture as in litres per square metre per day created under the, under the underside of that circuit. Not a successful outcome. So I don't think I'm gonna give you ventilation as a solution for a problem that you've got. I just wanted to throw up here, every commercial building has to really be insulated at roof level. We don't count ceiling insulation as having any value in commercial buildings. Because commercial ceilings, aluminium gridded, acoustic commercial ceilings leak like a sieve. They don't have a thermal performance. Then you get the recessed fluorescent light fittings. You find that the thermal loss in a commercial ceiling exceeds 5%. When it exceeds 5%, the BCA says you have to cancel out the value of the ceiling altogether and you have to put all the insulation to the underside of the roof. So the ceiling cancels out, the ceiling cavity cancels out, and it's all under the roof. So all office buildings, all shopping complexes, retail, public buildings, hospitals, school, universal, uh, university buildings and colleges are all done without any value at the ceiling level. So this is the ash grid spacer. Just to sort of, I'm only bringing this up to show you how far ahead commercial is. They don't have a condensation issue because they've got all this insulation under the roof. So this is your vapour barrier down here. Not showing very clearly that there's a, there's a silver sarking there. Okay, but it's kept, oh, the external temperature is kept divorced from it so it's not going to be at that zero degree temperature that's going to give us a condensation issue. This is what a commercial roof actually looks like. So from the years when, you know, five or six years ago when there was really no insulation under commercial roofs, to date we have these 100, 120, 140, 150, we have 60, 80, 100, 120 and 150 mil spacers. The standard spacer in Europe, for example, would be a 180 or a 200 mil spacer. So we're not quite as cold as them, but this is the nature of the commercial game. It has doubled the price of commercial roofs. A commercial roof used to be $25, $30. Now you've got to add on a good $25 for the extra insulation, the spacer, and the labour, as you can imagine, to install this system now. But it's been widely accepted. We don't have any problem with this anymore. This is a little project. So I'm showing you a few examples. This is a project up in the Dandenongs. I'm not going to tell you where it is because I don't want anybody to know. 
What we're doing at the moment here is we're spraying the bacterial growth in the actual ceilings. I'll explain what happened here is these are little uh, four square retirement units, self-contained. They were built in the 60s or 70s. So five years ago, they noticed the roofs were in poor repair, lots of flashings needed replacing, having issues with skylights. So they got roofer in. So five years ago, they replaced these roofs. They're just a nice little bowed roof, a sort of a little one degree thing. So the roofs were replaced, but while the uh, roofer was up there replacing the roofs, he thought he'd do the right thing. So he put an R3.5 ceiling back in the ceiling, and he dropped sarking under the roof as well. This is what happened. These roofs, there was such a condensation issue in these buildings because of the sarking, because of the insulation. So you can see the old leak like a sieve. The roof was kept warm because all the heat energy was rising up and keeping the roof warm. Everybody was standing in front of their heaters within two feet on a nice cold day because they weren't holding any heat energy at all. So the roofs were taken off again, five years down the track, sprayed for the bacteria. The insulation was dropped into bags on the ground. It is all wet and sodden. It actually weighs a tonne. When you dropped it on the ground, it went splat. We went and put a vapour barrier down as a sarking. We rolled this out. We lapped at 150 mil. We taped the joint so it was a truly taped vapour barrier. We dropped a hundred, uh, an 80 mil glass wool blanket. We then dropped a Proctor roof fabric over the top. We double taped the fabric. The end result is simple, that as soon as the moisture inside of the building rises up now, it's stopped getting to the roof by the vapour barrier. We, ex we assume all vapour barriers are going to fail, so any moisture that does make it through, gets through the plaster of course, rises up through the Proctor vapour permeable fabric, hits the roof, condensates, falls back on the fabric. It's the belts and braces approach. We double tape this because we know the water is going to pool and we know it's going to go sideways, so we certainly don't want it leaking back through the overlap, so it's double taped. What will happen, obviously, sorry, what will happen is, is the moisture will uh, collect here in these little valleys, and at some point in time, whether it's the next day or the next week, this, room's, this roof's going to warm up with a little bit of sun, a little bit of warmth, and we're going to evaporate these little areas of moisture that are building up, and there's a nice little bit of airflow via the ribs in the actual metal deck. The products come as a vapour. The Proctor wrap is uh, brought in from Europe by CSR. We decided to take on the distributorship for it three years ago. Residential, commercial, and a UV black sta uh, UV, uh, UV stable, what we call black label fabric. I'm getting the wind up over here, so the pressure's on. Okay, so really what I wanted to say to you is if you understand condensation, there is no reason why you're going to have a condensation issue. If you make the mistake, somehow you've got to fix the inherent flaw in the building. That's the tricky bit. If you make the mistake, we have roofs coming off. We have probably about 10 roofs in the Bendigo area, Shepherd, Aubrey, Wodonga. That's about the only solution. And the builders learn the problem in a fairly harsh manner. Okay, so I just want you to have a bit of a think about that. Again, it's not the strongest, most intelligent, it's the most responsive to change. I do this sort of thing to builders because they're usually sitting there going, I can't afford it and nobody else is going to do it. And I said, well, you can't afford not to do it.